This channel was born out of an obsession with Star Wars The Clone Wars, and over the years, we've talked extensively about nearly every single episode of this groundbreaking Star Wars series. One topic we keep coming back to time and time again is one of our favorite story arcs from the series, the Umbara arc, which spanned the middle episodes of the show's fourth season. These four episodes, Darkness on Umbara, The General, Plan of Descent, and Carnage of Krell, are widely recognized as some of the show's best, and for good reason. They do tone and atmosphere really well, they're full of compelling and well-written characters, and they're full of gritty themes and hard questions, all coming together to tell the story of the Battle of Umbara. But while we've talked about the events of these episodes a lot, we haven't talked nearly as much about the writing and themes of this arc. In case you haven't already guessed, that's exactly what we'll be doing in this video. Attention, Sergeant on deck! We trust that you've all watched the Umbara arc, but for many of you, it might have been a hot minute since you last watched the arc, so we're going to start with a summary of the episodes and their important points. If you think you remember the arc well enough to proceed, feel free to skip to the beginning of the next video chapter. Darkness of Umbara opens up with a brief bit of background on the Battle of Umbara. Umbara, a planet in the expansion region cloaked in endless twilight, has seceded from the Republic following the assassination of its senator in an earlier episode. Since Umbara sits on vital trade routes through the expansion region, the Republic has made recapturing Umbara its highest priority, and an enormous invasion force, led by Jedi Generals Skywalker, Kenobi, Tin, and Krell, has been deployed to take the planet. While battle rages in orbit, we follow Skywalker and the 501st Legion as they deploy onto Umbara, fighting a fierce battle against the Umbaran militia, which is equipped with unusual, highly alien weaponry and using the cover of their homeworld's jungles to wage guerrilla war against Republic forces. Not long into the battle, Anakin is suddenly recalled to Coruscant on the orders of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Command of the 501st Legion is then reassigned to General Pong Krell, who quickly proves himself to be a total a-hole. Krell makes a point of treating the clones as subhumans, insisting on addressing them by their numbers and sending them on suicidal frontal assaults. Over the course of Darkness of Umbara and the General, Krell sends them into trap after trap, incurring needless casualties and earning the ire of his men. At the end of the arc's second episode, some of the clones defy orders and steal a set of Umbaran starfighters, allowing the 501st to survive and capture an Umbaran airbase against all odds. In the next episode, Plan of Descent, Krell and the 501st settle in at the airbase and are alerted by General Kenobi that Republic forces elsewhere are being hit hard by orbital missiles. The same clones who stole the Umbaran fighters before, Fives, Jesse, and Hardcase, want to use their stolen ships to destroy the Separatist missile cruisers above the capital, but Krell instead insists on doing nothing, with Captain Rex and the trooper Dogma insisting on following his orders. Fives and company defy these orders and destroy the missile cruiser anyway, at the cost of Hardcase's life. When Fives and Jesse get back, Krell is pissed and orders them executed for insubordination. But in the subsequent episode, Carnage of Krell, the men of the 501st flat out refuse to kill them, and Krell instead sends the whole unit to wipe out a group of Umbaran soldiers who he claims to be wearing stolen clone armor. They do as ordered, but discover that the enemy platoon was actually just another clone unit, and that Krell had ordered them both to the same spot on purpose. Rex and the rest of the 501st have, by this point, had more than enough of Krell's nonsense, and so they set out to arrest him. They ultimately succeed in apprehending the rogue general, who reveals that he had fallen to the dark side and wanted to prove his worth to Count Dooku by costing the Republic the Battle of Umbara. Krell is killed by Dogma, and the men of the 501st learn that, while all that was going on, other Republic forces took the Umbaran capital, ending the battle. There's a lot to appreciate about this arc, but we're going to start by talking about Umbara itself. Aesthetically and thematically, the battle in this arc is much different from any other scene in Star Wars The Clone Wars. The main differences are pretty obvious. 
Umbara is dark as hell, and the clones are near exclusively fighting Umbaran soldiers, with the only battle droids in the Ark being those aboard the Separatist missile cruiser in the third episode. Both of these little details have a fair bit of depth to them. The titular darkness on Umbara gives the whole planet a uniquely sinister aesthetic. It isn't exactly explained why Umbara is always twilight in the Ark itself, but anyone who knows their lore or has a minute or two to spend on Wikipedia could tell you that Umbara was located in the Ghost Nebula, which dimmed the visible light from the planet's sun and kept Umbara constantly dark and chilly. In the Ark, this serves as a very unsubtle visual reinforcement of the episode's dark themes, and this isn't limited just to the fact that the planet is dark. Umbara is also very foggy, for example, and even its open battlefields are shrouded in a very literal fog of war. The environment design for Umbara plays into this as well. Most of the planet is dominated by jungle, which in Star Wars is a very common setting for particularly bloody and confusing battles. The jungles of Umbara are thoroughly alien, however. All of the planet's flora and fauna is jet black apart from vibrant bioluminescent strips and tendrils which usually glow red or purple. This works in tandem with the fog to not only look really cool, but also to convey the feeling of an unfamiliar, unfriendly, and deeply uncomfortable place to be. Put another way, Umbara is designed so that the clones and their equipment seem extremely out of place. They don't belong in this environment in more ways than one. This arc also goes out of its way to emphasize the real people behind the Separatist movement. Usually, the Clone Wars sees its heroes fighting expendable battle droids, whom we can watch be butchered by the Jedi and clones without much pause. But on Umbara, the clones are fighting the Umbarans themselves, who aren't some conquering droid army, but ordinary soldiers defending their homes. The clones are the invaders. The first episode's opening reel even makes clear that the Republic has no moral high ground whatsoever here, it just wants the trade routes Umbara controls. Of course, the battle itself even emphasizes that this is the Umbaran's home and that the clones are just trespassers. The Umbarans know the land better, their war machines are built for it more than the Republic's are, and the planet is littered with traps. The Umbarans carry out all manner of sophisticated guerrilla tactics while the clones are mostly just stumbling around, shooting at whatever they bump into, just trying not to get killed or lost. The Umbarans are still framed as antagonists, and they aren't made all that sympathetic. Wrongly, we would argue, but that's another video. There's slight hints that the government on Umbara, or maybe just the military, is at least a little sketchy. The Umbaran soldiers, for example, wear sealed off helmets full of what supplemental materials establish is basically berserker gas, a cocktail of chemical agents meant to make the Umbarans better soldiers. But although that's certainly sketchy, there's still absolutely nothing to justify the Republic invasion. This isn't really addressed in the episode. The clones don't think about why they're on Umbara at all. They're in the dark, both literally and figuratively, and for much of the arc, that's fine with them. The clones are, after all, used to just doing what the Jedi Generals and Supreme Chancellor tell them to do. That's something that's very prominent all throughout the arc, and in other contexts, it's questioned by some of the clones. The second half of the Umbara arc is about the clones reacting to orders that are simply wrong, but that theme is never quite taken all the way. The clones never realize that the invasion of Umbara itself was wrong, an order that should have never been followed. Even after they've turned on Krell, they're still just following orders, a theme we'll come back to later. Now, we can't talk about the setting of Umbara without talking about the Ark's obvious parallels with the Vietnam War. Actually, that's not quite right. The actual parallels the Ark is drawing are with Vietnam War movies. This comes with parallels to the war itself, of course. Everything we just said about the Battle of Umbara being unjust is clearly based on the injustice of the Vietnam War. The setting is also an obvious aesthetic parallel as is the scene in Darkness on Umbara when Republic Y-Wings carpet bomb a whole ridge to wipe out a group of Umbaran insurgents. But like most Vietnam War movies, the Umbara arc isn't really concerned with exploring that part. Rather, like your average Vietnam movie, the Umbara arc is specifically about exploring the struggles and internal conflicts of the invaders 
who have been forced into a situation they don't understand and are reckoning with watching their side do all manner of terrible things to win a pointless battle. There are many highly acclaimed movies about the Vietnam War that more or less follow that structure. Full Metal Jacket is one, as is Apocalypse Now, though the latter was actually based on a book called Heart of Darkness, which is set in the Congo decades before the Vietnam War. And yep, before you ask, that's exactly where the title of the Felucia mission in Battlefront 2 came from. The Umbara arc is essentially a tribute to these movies, less about the Vietnam War itself and more about Americans' cultural memory of it, which is an important distinction because there are differences between that cultural memory and the war itself that stand out in the Umbaran arc. This is why very little time is spent on the Umbarans themselves, for instance, and why the arc never questions their role as antagonists, despite the obvious injustice of the setting. That part's just flavor, meant to emphasize the stories of the clones, which is what the Umbara arc is all about. What makes this particularly interesting is that, for those who don't know, Star Wars A New Hope actually originated from the rough concept for Apocalypse Now. The original trilogy was, in part, one big Vietnam War allegory, with the US and its allies represented not by the protagonists in the Umbara arc, but by the Galactic Empire. That makes Star Wars' stance on the conflict pretty clear, as far as we can see, so we can forgive the Umbara arc a little for not addressing the hard questions posed by the war as a whole. Star Wars did do a whole trilogy on it, after all. The Umbara arc's main conflict is instead a classic Vietnam War movie one about a bunch of grunts having to deal with a bad commander. It puts a spin on this usual formula, however, by having the commanding officer be a Jedi. Unlike ordinary high-ranking Republic officers who quite often turn out to be incompetent, unlikable, evil, or some combination therein in Clone Wars era media, the Jedi are usually cast in a favorable light, particularly in Star Wars The Clone Wars. This isn't a universal rule. As with the prequel trilogy itself, the Clone Wars often levies criticism at the Jedi Council and the Order's stodgier members. But even the Jedi the Clone Wars criticizes are still made out to be good people who believe in justice and who, when acting as generals on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, care deeply about the lives of the clones under their command. Then there's Pong Krell. Krell is horrible on all levels. He clearly detests the clones and uses them as cannon fodder, and he exemplifies all the worst traits of the Jedi. The arrogance, the self-righteousness, the holier-than-thou attitude that makes you want to punch him in his big, jiggling chin. If you've seen Battlestar Galactica, his character is strikingly reminiscent of Admiral Kane, with their shared love of war crimes, sending people on suicide missions, and executing people when they rightfully disobey orders. The whole Umbara arc is strikingly similar to the episodes Pegasus and Resurrection Ship Parts 1 and 2 actually, but that's neither here nor there. Krell is revealed at the end of the arc to have fallen to the dark side. He claims to Captain Rex that he had a vision of how the Clone Wars would end, that the Jedi would be destroyed by the Sith, and that his plan was to cost the Republic the Battle of Umbara, so that Dooku would take him as a Sith apprentice. How much Krell saw is unclear. If he was aware of Order 66, that might have played a role in how he treated clones. But this doesn't really change much in either case, especially from the clone's perspective. Dialogue earlier in the arc states that clone units under Krell's command suffered extremely high casualties across the board, implying that even before he fell to the dark side, Krell wasn't all that different as a general. This isn't a theme that's unique to the Umbara arc. Other Clone Wars era stories suggest that most Jedi were mediocre tacticians at best. Indeed, this shows in the films as well. Yoda's tactics in the Battle of Geonosis, which saw Jedi and clones straight up charge separatist positions when they could have shelled them from orbit, probably led to a whole lot of unnecessary clone deaths. We've done whole videos explaining why Jedi tactics were like this, but the heart of the matter is that the Jedi weren't generals, and when thrust into that role, they just didn't perform all that well. They were excellent fighters, yes. They were good at pulling off absurd plans and small-scale missions, often to great effect. But when it came to grand strategy and galactic-scale warfare, the Jedi only really performed well when there was a way for a small Jedi-led strike team to pull off some improbable behind-the-scenes foolery. When it was just a matter of conventional strategy, the Jedi were less than impressive. Krell isn't just an exception to the rule for us to hate. 
He demonstrates how crappy Jedi tactics regularly get clones killed. Sure, he was deliberately sending the clones on suicide missions, but to most of them, it would have been hard to tell the difference between that and some of the other crazy Jedi tactics they had seen. Krell is a general who is absolutely not cut out to lead an army, but neither were the motsini of other Jedi generals with only a handful of exceptions. His purpose is to show the audience the ugly side of Jedi Command, and his hidden dark side nature doesn't change that, just as Atrus's dark side nature in KOTOR 2 doesn't change how much she embodies all that sucks about the Jedi Council. More importantly, the clones of the 501st Legion wouldn't have seen a difference between Krell and other subpar Jedi generals. Most of them never even learned that he had fallen to the dark side. From their perspective, Krell was just a particularly nasty Jedi general. Other Clone Wars era stories feature clones who openly dislike or distrust the Jedi due to their incompetence. It's not hard to imagine that the Battle of Umbara would add more clones to that camp. Krell, of course, isn't just a bad general though. The real reason he's such a hateable character isn't that he sucks at strategy, but that his bad tactics come in tandem with the open dehumanization of his subordinates. Krell makes it very clear right away that he does not see clones as people. He insists on referring to them by their numbers, he resents any display of independence or ingenuity, and he uses his clones as cannon fodder, sending them into minefields, through narrow, exposed gorges, and in reckless full frontal assaults against well-defended positions. And as we said earlier, the episode indicates that he's always been like this even before he fell to the dark side. He might not have been as spiteful about it before, but he still clearly has never seen clones as people. This is also interesting coming from a Jedi general because it was the Jedi who encouraged the clones to act as individuals in the first place. Krell treats the clones the way the Kaminoans did and the way the Kaminoans expected the Jedi to. The Kaminoans, after all, saw the clones strictly as products and they cracked down harshly on any aberrations. Most clones, at least at first, thus saw themselves in a similar light. Many clones never chose names, never chose to express themselves, and saw themselves as soldiers bred for a single purpose, with nothing else to live for or aspire to. It was the Jedi that changed that. The Jedi encouraged their clones to take ordinary names for themselves, to paint their armor and style their hair differently to be independent and individual. They encouraged the clones to live their lives fully, to the extent that they could while in service to the Republic. The Jedi saw the clones as people at a time when not even the clones themselves did. The force flowed through them, after all, and as Yoda said in a much earlier episode of The Clone Wars, that made their lives unique and worth as much as anyone else's. This was especially true for the 501st, who served under Anakin Skywalker, a Jedi who encouraged individuality, ingenuity, and would sign off on the most Bat-Sith crazy plans the galaxy has ever seen. To go from Skywalker to Krell would have been whiplash for them. It certainly was for the audience, after all. It's treatment that the clones wouldn't have even found unusual before the start of the Clone Wars, but because the men of the 501st have seen what respect really means, because the Jedi have taught them to think for themselves as people, it's something that they can't go back on. It calls to attention the injustice of their position as the slaves of the Republic, compelled to blindly follow orders and invade innocent worlds for their political choices. Krell's dehumanization of the clones isn't unique. Sergeant Slick, who did absolutely nothing wrong by the way, noted as such as far back as the Clone Wars' first season. The condition of the Grand Army of the Republic as a whole was dehumanizing. The Jedi may have helped the clones be individuals, but legally, they still weren't people. The clones were the slaves of the Republic, and there's nothing more dehumanizing than slavery. Krell, by being so overt and offensive in his dehumanization of the clones, encourages us to think about that. It certainly encourages the clones to do some second guessing of their own. A big chunk of the Umbara Arcs plot is driven by clones coming up with out-of-the-box solutions to unpleasant tactical situations. This is hardly out of the ordinary for the Clone Wars, but on Umbara, it happens in a different context. The clones are usually explicitly ordered against whatever they want to do by Krell. The Clone Wars in general is not shy in having protagonists who disobey orders. Anakin does it all the time after all, and rarely gets more than an eye roll from the Jedi Council so long as everything works out. 
The Clone Wars has trained us to see breaking or bending the rules as an ordinary thing, so long as it goes as planned and no one gets hurt unnecessarily. But the Umbara arc turns that preconditioning against the audience and against its characters. Star Wars The Clone Wars loves dissent, as does Star Wars as a whole. If the show can be distilled down to a single message, that message is think for yourself and never be afraid to question or challenge authority. Often, you can tell how heroic a character in the show is meant to be purely based on how much stock they put into following orders, respecting command authority, and being unquestioningly loyal to the powers that be. The Umbara arc is one of many stories from the show to touch on this message. In doing so, it's fielding criticism of an unfortunately common way of thinking, valuing abstract notions of authority and hierarchy more than victory, more than lives, or more than literally anything that actually matters. In most real world and even many sci-fi militaries, the sort of disregard for orders that the clones often show would be viewed more or less as Krell views it, as a threat to unit cohesion and command authority. From a military perspective, Krell's displeasure at the clones blatantly disregarding his orders isn't out of the ordinary up until he starts ordering them to be executed for it. But if there's one thing Star Wars The Clone Wars absolutely hates, it's blindly following orders when you have a better idea, and thus it's sharply critical of Krell's reaction to the ingenuity of his men. Most of the audience might not even notice it, but it's commentary on the failings of that style of command. Something, as we said earlier, that the Umbara arc has in common with many Vietnam War movies. Krell, as the audience knows full well, is wrong about the clones. They are people, and the Umbara arc emphasizes this strongly the whole way through. This arc involves more named clone characters than any other in the entire show, and it spends plenty of time underscoring the differences in their personality and their humanity. Some clones are strongly against Krell from the beginning, most notably the Ark Trooper Fives and, to a lesser degree, Jesse and Hardcase. Others are more inclined to follow Krell's orders, regardless of their misgivings, like Captain Rex and Sergeant Apo, while Dogma makes blind obedience practically his whole personality, which the others clearly dislike him for. The Ark has a number of scenes where clones don't wear their helmets in situations they otherwise would, like the troopers who were chosen to execute Fives and Jesse. All of it is done to underscore the fact that the clones, at the end of the day, are just ordinary people forced into horrific circumstances. The audience is meant to draw a connection between this and the clones' disobedience. The two themes aren't separate at all, but intertwined. The Umbara arc argues that being a person means being able to dissent, to think for yourself, and to disobey orders. The blind obedience that Krell expects that far too many real-world authority figures expect is inhuman in the eyes of the Clone Wars, a sort of treatment that no one deserves. Wait! This is wrong, and we all know it. The General is making a mistake, and he needs to be called on it. No clone should have to go out this way! We are loyal soldiers. We follow orders, but we are not a bunch of unthinking droids! We are men. We must be trusted to make the right decisions, especially when the orders we are given are wrong! FIRE! This theme plays out alongside another running theme in the Umbara arc, which is loyalty. Loyalty is a bit more complicated in the Clone Wars than obedience is, given different connotations dependent on the context. Personal loyalty is depicted as something that's always honourable and admirable, even when it leads to bad decisions. Bad calls made out of loyalty are treated as being more sympathetic, and loyalty at other times is treated as an essential virtue of the Jedi and the clones. On a personal level, loyalty is part of what constitutes heroism in Star Wars The Clone Wars. But then there's the broader, more abstract forms of loyalty. Loyalty to principles is treated like personal loyalty, but loyalty to authority is treated with a bit more suspicion. While clones are depicted as heroic for being loyal to their friends, their unquestioned loyalty to the Republic is usually treated rather neutrally. Loyalty to authority is blind loyalty, a choice that's typically made for the clones, and so it's not righteous on its own. In some cases, loyalty to authority is shown to be outright wrong, 
as is the case in the Umbara arc. This is something the clones struggle with over the course of the arc. They want to do what they know is right, but they don't want to be traitors. Throughout Star Wars The Clone Wars, betrayal is treated as the greatest of sins, especially when a clone betrays another clone. Usually, this happens in the context of personal loyalty, but the clones have all been indoctrinated to see disrespecting command authority and disobeying the authority of the Republic as betrayal as well. They don't care about Krell, but betraying him would be betraying the command structure, the Grand Army as a whole. Most of the clones don't know if that's something they could or should really do. For the first two episodes of the arc, the clones mostly get to avoid dealing with this question. They do as General Skywalker taught them, skirting the rules instead of breaking them entirely. But in the second half of the arc, they have to face the contradiction directly. Fives, Jesse and Hardcase come up with the correct answer. The real betrayal would be to obey General Krell's suicidal orders. Doing so would betray the Republic, costing it the battle, and it could also cost the lives of many clones. They conclude that they not only can disobey orders, but that they must disobey orders. The chain of command is worth nothing if it leads to unnecessary deaths and defeat. The clone's direct disobedience turns the tide of the whole battle in the Republic's favor, and Fives and Jesse, the two that survive, should have been hailed as heroes. Instead, Krell orders them executed for treason. This is obviously wrong and depicted as such, and it forces the rest of the clones to confront the conflict between obedience and betrayal as well. As Fives and Jesse did, they make the right choice. Krell punishes them by arranging the friendly fire incident, following which it becomes apparent that he's been dumb on purpose this whole time. The clones are then forced with the hardest choice of all, whether or not to mutiny. By the final episode of the Umbara arc, it has become abundantly clear that good soldiers do not, in fact, follow orders. But it's a bit of a leap from disobedience to overthrowing your commanding officers. Nonetheless, it's a leap the clones have to take, and after the friendly fire incident, they do it pretty readily. Everyone, except Dogma that is, who finally gets told to shut up and is tossed in a cell. Then Fives rallies the men and they go to arrest General Krell. After a bit of a fight, they succeed, thanks to some quick thinking by Tup. This is something the arc unequivocally portrays as good, which is actually a pretty radical statement in a good way. In your typical Vietnam War movie, the way the grunts deal with the incompetent officer is via fragging, which is to say quietly assassinating said commanding officer and passing it off as an accident. This is more brutal than an arrest to be sure, but it's actually less rebellious in the sense that it disrupts the chain of command less. It's not confronting the problem, but quietly eliminating the individual instance of it and then pretending that it wasn't a deliberate act. What the Umbara arc is championing is outright mutiny. The clones not only disrupt the chain of command, but flip it on its head, outright denying the authority of their commanding officer and using force to get rid of them without making excuses or arranging for convenient accidents. The clones are owning the fact that they're overthrowing General Krell and that they don't give a Sith whether or not he outranks them anymore. It's a complete rejection of authority and hierarchy, which is very on brand for Star Wars but a bold statement in the context of the Umbara arc's inspiration. And again, the Umbara arc unequivocally paints this as a good thing. You're meant to cheer, or at least be happy, when Captain Rex decides that enough is enough and that Krull needs to be removed by any means necessary. The clones in the arc feel the significance of what they're doing a bit more keenly, but after the friendly fire incident, they really don't care anymore and want Krell's head more than they care about authority anymore. They know in their guts that rebelling is the right thing to do, the only right thing to do. Star Wars is all about rebellion and revolution. It's very open in its assertion that it is not only justifies to use violent force against unjust authorities, but that doing so is the only moral thing to do. Star Wars asserts that authority has to justify its own existence, typically through democratic consensus, to be valid and worth following and that might alone does not, in fact, make right. The Umbara arc extends this theme into the realm of military authority, into discussions about the chain of command. It's pretty gutsy, and its gutsiness doesn't end there either. Once Krell has been detained, then Rex has one last choice to make, 
whether or not to finish the job and put the bastard down for good. Rex doesn't need to execute Krill. He isn't sure how long he and his men could hold the Jedi and figures that it would probably be best to take him out then and there, but that's not why Rex is considering killing Krell. It's made obvious enough that Rex wants to kill Krell for revenge. He's a piece of trash who deserves to die for everything he's done, especially after the clones he's deliberately killed, and it's easy to rationalize giving Krell exactly what he deserves as justice. That isn't how execution ever works though. Whether we admit it to ourselves or not, execution and punishment for its own sake in general is always about revenge. Rex knows this. It's why he hesitates to pull the trigger and kill Krell. He's totally down for mutiny by this point, and his hesitation isn't some remnant of blind loyalty to the chain of command. Now, the audience doesn't really care by this point. After four episodes of Krell's nonsense, we want our catharsis, which means seeing that bastard shot in his cell. The Clone Wars ultimately finds the way to give us our wish while keeping Rex's hands clean. Dogma is the one to kill Krell, furious over his betrayal and at himself for going along with it for so long. Not to return to this tangent for too long, that's another parallel to Admiral Kane, who was also killed by a semi-antagonist, prisoner in both cases, so that the good guys wouldn't have to stoop that low. But this scene where Rex contemplates killing Krell is significant for another reason. When this arc was airing, our theory was that things would end with a legitimate single case issuance of Order 66, and that the purpose of this arc was to explain why so many clones went through with the Order after all the work the show did in humanizing them. We weren't entirely on the money there, but there are still traces of those themes to pick up on. Because, as we mentioned earlier, Krell wasn't entirely unique. He was uniquely spiteful, but he wasn't the only Jedi General making constant bad calls and getting clones needlessly killed. Like we said earlier, from the perspective of a grunt, Krell's tactics weren't much different from Yoda's or Kiadi Mundi's. And for the clones that saw things that way, the Battle of Umbara taught them a lesson about the Jedi they wouldn't soon forget. That Jedi didn't necessarily have the best interests of the Republic in mind. Krell was a traitor. Is it a stretch to imagine that other Jedi who have similar tactics are as well? Ultimately, Star Wars The Clone Wars went with the brainship explanation of Order 66, and we've given our thoughts on that before, namely that we think it's a cheap cop-out. But the Umbara arc still adds clarity and context to Order 66. It shows that not every Jedi General was as kindly as Plo Koon or Obi-Wan, and even they threw lives away sometimes when it was tactically necessary. It shows that there were instances where it would be absolutely indisputably right for clones to mutiny against their Jedi generals. It even shows that there are situations in which a Jedi who's betrayed the Republic has to be summarily executed, and that there are situations in which the Jedi deserve, in the clones' minds, to be summarily executed. The Umbara arc doesn't go that far, and that's probably for the best. Not only would that be very dark, even for the Clone Wars, but it would also be justifying revenge and murder, which flies in the face of Star Wars' morals. But the Umbara arc still shows us how the clones could justify Order 66 to themselves, and in a way that's decently convincing. Compare how the clones reacted to Krell's betrayal with the following quote from Commander Bakara. I hesitated for a moment when I received Order 66, because the last thing I expected was a Jedi coup. Did I feel betrayed? You bet I did. I thought of all my men who died under Kiadi Mundi's command, and if I'd had known then that he and his buddies were gearing up to do the separatists' work for them and overthrow the government, I'd have shot him as a traitor a lot earlier. He betrayed the trust of every one of us. Consider soon-to-be Commander Apo, who watched General Krell send his brothers to die on Umbara, who watched him deliberately engineer a friendly fire incident, who admitted to undermining the Republic from within. We don't have any quote from him to reveal what he was thinking when he received Order 66 and instructions to march in the Jedi Temple, but we've got a good guess as to what came to his mind first. For Apo and all the men of the 501st that were with him on Umbara, we have no doubt their thoughts during Order 66 were consumed by memories of General Krell. The Umbara arc was Star Wars The Clone Wars at its best, and we hope you've enjoyed our analysis of its themes and implications. But what do you think? Is there anything about this arc that you think we missed? 
Let us know your guys' mini analyses in the comments below because we're always keen to read them. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.